Thank you very much. I'd like to start with uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to this, uh, what promises to be a, a really nice workshop. So I'm, I'm very interested um, by spatial vegetation structure, especially in Mediterranean drylands. Uh, you have here a, a picture of, of what it may look like. This is a picture taken in Spain, um, close to Alicante. And one of the, the questions that I'm trying to address in the, in the last few years is, if I look at a, a dryland and the way the, spatial vegeta the vegetation is spatially organized, does that tell me anything about the history of the system? the underlying ecological mechanisms, and also the, the resilience of the system to perturbations. So of course, the world around us is changing, and we've, in the last 150 years, we've induced faster and larger changes on our environment than any, in any other period of time in human history. And this is accentuated by the fact that uh, climate is changing. So we're imposing increasing pressures on ecosystems. And we may wonder how ecosystems can, can cope with these increasing pressures. Well, we know that there is a variety of ways uh, ecosystems can respond to increasing pressure. So if we follow a state of, an, of the ecosystem that could be an aggregated variable of, of relevance for the system we're Studying. So in the case of Mediterranean dryland, the typical variable would be um, total vegetation cover, so the percentage of, of the soil that is covered by vegetation. And if we follow how that variable changes when an, an external pressure is increasing, uh, typically precipitation could be decreasing, temperature could be increasing. Then we know that some systems respond in a continuous way to an increasing pressure, and in that case, we talk of gradual and reversible response because once the pressure decreases again, the system would come back to its original state. Well, as Max told us just before, of course not all ecosystems respond that way. And in some cases, ecosystems hardly respond to an increasing pressure until a point or threshold is reached at which they collapse to a different state. In that case, we talk of abrupt, unexpected uh, response. And one of the problems with these type of responses is that usually they're very difficult to reverse. It's very difficult to come back to the original state after a shift occurred. As an illustration, this is a picture that was taken uh, in Spain, close to Zaragoza. Um, it's uh, currently a natural reserve uh, called El Planeron. And this is what we consider to be the healthy state of the system. However, if you walk that way about 200 meters, this is what the system looked like. This system was grazed until the 50s and was heavily grazed. And at some point in time, we don't know exactly when, there was a shift. So cover drastically decreased. Um, you see that there is a crust formation on top of the soil. The white areas are salt accumulation. You see also uh, erosion figures here. And you might also be able to see that there is a shift in species composition uh, from a system dominated by this uh, grass lesium spartum to this um, shrubby Suida vera um, that is actually adapted to high salt concentration in the soil. Now, this area was bought in the 90s by an NGO, BirdLife, and so we know that probably for, well, from the 90s for sure, but probably much before, uh, this system has not been grazed at all. And although it hasn't been grazed for at least 23 years, um, it has not recovered at all. So this is an example of a case where a system abruptly shifted to a different state. And despite the fact that the external pressure was released, the system did not go back to its original state. And drylands are famously known to behave or to be able to behave in this way. Well, drylands cover 40% of the land area on Earth, and they host about one-third of the population uh, among the poorest inhabitants of developing countries. So in this context, it would be extremely valuable if we could devise indicators of degradation. Now, one of the striking features of drylands is that the vegetation cover is patchy. It's not homogeneous, but it's... Um, vegetation is organized in patches. 
And this is due to the fact that some species in these ecosystems are able to um, improve the local environment and facilitate the recruitment of other species that are not adapted to or not as well adapted to the dry conditions. Of course, because resource and especially water is extremely limiting, there is also very harsh competition for resource in the system. So what um, theoretical studies have shown is that it is this balance between facilitation and competition, and especially the spatial scales at which facilitation and competition operate that drive the spatial structure that we observe in the system. This is a figure that is borrowed um, from a paper uh, from Jos van Hadenbeek published in 2010. And what these theoretical studies show is that there are basically two broad categories of spatial patterns that we can see in dryland. They are the peri periodic regular patterns and what we call, what I call the irregular <laughs> patterns. Um, so in this case, in white here is vegetation and, and black is bare ground. In the periodic regular pattern, you have patches that tend to reach a similar size and at a similar distance from each other. Whereas in that case, in the case of the irregular patterns, um, you have patches of, of very different sizes that coexist in the system. If you plot the number of patches of a certain size as a function of the size, you see that in the case of the regular pattern, you have a peak here that um, indicates that there is a characteristic spatial scale of the system. Whereas in the case of the irregular pattern, you have this uh, heavy tail distribution that can be described by Paolo, Paolo with exponential cutoff or exponential distribution, log normal distribution, but heavy tail in any case, so you have um, patches of all kinds of different sizes and they lack a typical um, patch scale. Now what the, the theoretical models showed, uh, there was a paper by Mano and Schnub in 2008 and then the paper of uh, von Hardenberg and colleagues in 2010, is that by changing the scale, the spatial scale at which competition operates, you can go from the periodic patterns to the irregular patterns. And in this case, um, competition occurs at intermediate spatial scale and that drives uh, the scale of the patterns. But if you make competition occur at much larger spatial scales, for example, if uh, surface water runoff is much faster compared to infiltration rate, then you get what we call global competition, so competition occurring at broad scale in the system. And in that case, we get the irregular structure. So these are two extreme cases. Um, but actually, probably in nature, we can see both cases, but we can also see uh, a number of cases that are intermediate to this. So this could be a whole gradient that is observed uh, in nature. So different type of underlying ecological mechanisms seem to lead to different type of spatial structures in dryland. Interestingly, uh, these spatial structures, they respond to increasing stress. So here, if we have a, a stress gradient, um, Max already showed us that the, the regular pattern, they tend to move from gap to labyrinth to spot. And it was already suggested a, a while ago um, that the spot patterns could be indicators of, of imminent desertification in drylands in the case of regular pattern. The irregular patterns, they change as well, but it looks like the, the change in the, the shape of the patterns themselves is not as obvious, at least to the eye. However, if we look at the, at the patch size distribution, so the number of patches as a function of the size of the patches, then the shape of the distribution seems to change along a gradient of, uh, of aridity. And what happens is that, or stress, if aridity increases or herbivory increases, you get a distribution where you have um, less and less large patches, so a more and more fragmented system. So there is a change in the shape of the distribution and in a change in the number and size of the larger patches observed in the system. So this we tested um, in, on uh, three data sets from Mediterranean ecosystem, and they seem to show a similar um, behavior along a herbivory gradient. Since then, there was a number of studies that tried to test that on different data sets in different areas in China, in Australia, and also in, in Spain. And all these studies um, confirm part of the theory and infirm part of it. So it's not always very clear when this would, this type of, um, this theoretical concept would work and in which system. 
So there is now a crucial lack for empirical tests of these uh, theoretical ideas. The last point that I'd like to make about this, that what these models predict is if we look at um, different type of transition, so a continuous gradual behavior and a discontinuous or catastrophic shift of behavior, um, what, what the model predicts is that independently of the type of, of response of the system, the, the spatial structure would change in a predictable way. So here you have areas where you have spanning clusters, so very large spatial patterns. Here the system is described by a paolo, here by a paolo with exponential cutoff, and here uh, by an exponential distribution. So, and this is independent of the type of response. So all of this suggests that maybe we can assess ecosystems degradation levels by looking at them, by looking at their spatial structure. And actually trying to address that question is the purpose of a, a European project, Cascade, that started at the beginning of 2012. And it gathers a number of groups within Europe that try to understand why and when do drylands respond in a catastrophic way to increasing pressures. And that also tries to define and test um, indicators of degradation in Mediterranean drylands. And so now I'm going to present you very preliminary uh, results that we are, um, yeah, the work that we're do doing within the, the framework of Cascade. So we're working on, on a number of, of sites that are in Spain, um, along a gradient from the center of Spain to the southeast of Spain. This is the similar data set that, uh, data set that was published um, by Fernando Maestre in 2009 and 2012. And we're trying to address the question of whether vegetation cover and spatial structure change in a predictable way along a degradation gradient. So what we have is 24 aerial images uh, along this environmental gradient here, where the resolution of a pixel is 25 centimeters, so very high uh, resolution aerial images. In addition to these images, we have climate data, so average annual precipitation and temperature. We have vegetation cover that was estimated on the ground based on one-dimensional transects. And we have a number of uh, soil functioning variables that were measured using five samples in each site and brought to the lab in 2006 by Fernando Maestre and his team. Uh, so for example, we have soil respiration, organic carbon, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and so on, and a number of enzymes. Um, so this is an example of the aer an aerial image. You see a red, red point is centered um, in, the, in the center of where the five soil samples were taken. And around each of these points, we, we cut a 30 meter by 30 meter aerial image. So this is an example of a 30 meter by 30 meter image. Then we transform them into binary images. Um, uh, so we just have like black for vegetation and white uh, for bare ground. And based on that, we can do a number of spatial statistics on the, um, on, on the system. So what we measure is, for example, spatial intercorrelation um, of the system, uh, total vegetation cover, so the percentage of, of ground that is covered by vegetation, the patch density or the number of patches um, per area, um, the percentage of the image that is covered by the largest patch in the image, the patch size standard deviation, the mean patch size, and uh, so on. A patch is defined as an area that is continuously covered by vegetation. The other thing is that the other type of uh, information we extracted from, from the aerial image is we plotted the, the cumulative patch size distribution, so the number of patches larger than a certain size here on a log log scale. And based on that, we can plot um, a paolo um, distribution and we can estimate the slope of this paolo and we can also estimate uh, how good the fit is uh, by using a R square. So we can estimate a kind of distance to the paolo. Um, it's important to note here that actually all of these sites are very well described by heavy tail distributions. So what we have now is a, a number of variables that were measured in the field and a number of spatial statistics that we extracted from aerial images. 
But how do we define a degradation gradient? It's actually not obvious in these sites because they were grazed and they have been heavily grazed in the past. But in Spain, in a lot of areas, um, grazing has stopped uh, in the past. And so what we look at today is kind of a ghost of the past. Like we don't have a very clear degradation driver that, it, that occurs today. However, we know that there is uh, a gradient in terms of functioning of this system. So systems have been more or less degraded in the past, and they have more or less recovered through time. So what we did is actually uh, using the same approach as what um, Maestre uh, did in 2009 and 2012, is we use the soil functioning variables and we do a, a principal competent analysis on the soil variables to try to define orthogonal predictors that would give us an idea of um, a gradient of ecosystem functioning. And once we have these predictors, the idea is to relate them to the spatial statistics to see how the how different type of spatial structures are associated with different type of ecosystem functioning. So there were actually four axes, four components of the principal component analysis that had an eigenvalue superior to one, but I'm only going to present results related to the two first axes that describe 53% um, of the variance, of the total variance. And well, the interpretation of the axis is not directly straightforward, but the first axis is, um, these are, sorry, these axes are correlated to only, each of them to only four of the soil variables that is that's significant. So the first axis is significantly correlated with these uh, four variables, including two uh, soil enzymes, organic carbon, nitrogen, and the second axis is significantly correlated with total phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, and organic carbon. Now, how do these axes relate to the spatial statistics? Along each of these axes, an increasing value would mean a higher functioning in terms of, of, of these predictors. So the first axis is um, significantly related to only three of the spatial statistics. Uh, the slope of the power law, the patch density, and the spatial autocorrelation. It's very interesting to note here that cover is not significantly related to this first axis. Neither are precipitation or temperature. So because these uh, three variables are actually highly correlated with each other, I'm going to focus on describing um, what happens when uh, the slope of the power law changes along this first axis that has the highest R square. Um, so if I start with a system that is considering to have a high functioning along the first axis of the principal component analysis, this is the type of distribution we observe. And when the functioning in terms of axis 1 decreases, this is the changes that we observe. So what you see is that the distribution becomes less steep as uh, functioning decreases. Now, I was kind of curious to see how much of that was due to actually difference in species composition of the systems, because you can, maybe it's not very easy to see, but you can see that in some of the pictures, in some of the sites, you have very clearly different type of, of vegetation with different characteristic size of the individual. So I was curious to see how much of that was actually driven by changes in species composition between the sites. And so I correlated this axis one with species richness and there is actually a significant positive relationship. So of course also with the slope of the power law. So a higher functioning along axis one of the principal component analysis means um, a steeper slope of the power law that is uh, also related to a higher species richness. Now, uh, regarding the second axis of the principal component analysis, there were four um, spatial statistics that were significantly related to it. The distance to the power law, so um, the one minus R square of the fit, cover, uh, the percentage of the image covered by the largest patch, and the patch size standard deviation. Um, here you see that most of these relationships seem to be driven by one point, but if actually you remove that point, you keep a significant negative relationship between both uh, variables. So focusing again on, on this, 
relationship, what happens when the functioning of the system decreases along axis two, is that you see that the shape of the distribution changes, and so you get a stronger deviation uh, from a power dome. Again, all of these variables are very uh, significantly correlated with each other. So there's still some work to do in understanding uh, what would be the best descriptor um, of, of uh, the functioning of the system. But to summarize, so higher functioning in terms of axis one would mean steeper slope of the power law and increasing distance to the power law fit, but also higher cover and higher species richness. These are very preliminary results, and as I said, there's still quite a lot to do to understand exactly all of these um, analyses. But what I wanted to show with this is that we can show that spatial structure in these systems is related with ecosystem functioning. So spatial structure seems to tell us something about ecosystem functioning. But if I go back to my first question, with, which was, can we define indicators of degradation in Mediterranean dryland? One of the, one of the main um, variable that is usually followed along a gradient is total cover. And it makes sense because indeed we expect that a more degraded system would have a lower cover, and cover is quite easily um, measurable in the, in the field. However, because drylands can behave either in continuous or in discontinuous way, there are many cases with only following cover uh, would not tell us how close the system is to a tipping point. So if the system is here, the cover is still pretty high, but the system is actually very close to a tipping point. However, what the theoretical studies seem to suggest is that following the spatial structure may indicate that the system is close to a tipping point. So spatial structure and cover actually provide quite different information that are probably very complementary. Another way of illustrating this difference in type of information that cover and spatial structure provide is, so here for the different sites in Spain that I analyzed, I plotted the cover. Um, as a function of or the patch size distribution as a function of cover. And uh, you see that when cover increases, um, there are higher and higher patch sizes. That's, that makes sense. But then what I plotted in, in green and red are sites where there are spanning clusters. So all the green sites have at least one vegetation patch that goes from one side to the other of the picture. So to simplify, these sites are fundamentally connected in terms of vegetation, whereas these sites have no spanning clusters, so they are fundamentally fragmented. And what you see is that below a, a threshold of a, a cover, or below certain cover, you only have fragmented sites. Above a certain cover, you only have spanning clusters or sites with spanning cluster. But there is a whole range of cover. There's even this, for the same cover value, you can have spanning clusters or not. So for the same cover, you can have sites that are either fundamentally fragmented or fundamentally connected. So the spatial, the spatial structure might be different, although you have um, a similar cover. Well, so what the theory tells us, or seems to indicate, is that for at least irregular patterns, so for systems that are described by irregular spatial vegetation structure, Along an environmental, uh, along a stress gradient, we would, have, we would observe a change in the patch size distribution from a power low to uh, a distribution that, that is more bent, uh, that has less uh, large patches and more fragmented uh, patches. However, um, actually there are many mechanisms, ecological mechanisms, that could lead to a change in the patch size distribution. And we could imagine that a change, for example, in underlying ecological mechanism could lead to also a system that ha goes from a power law to a more uh, band distribution. For example, if we have mechanism that increase um, a certain positive feedback, so the system, a system that would go from irregular to regular to a more regular structure would also have the same type of behavior. We can also imagine that in certain cases there are species that start invading the system. For example, sometimes uh, when grazing pressure is high, 
some species that are adapted to grazing get an advantage and start invading the system. And if these species that start invading the system have different typical, patch, typical size of an individual or different way of reproducing, more local reproduction, for example, then the spatial, the patch size distribution may be strongly affected um, and that would, that would have effect on the patch size distribution. That would be very different than what the theory predicts because the theory predicts for a regular pattern what would happen in a system with a given type of vegetation and a given type of soil under increasing stress. Um, so this, this tells us that actually we need to know about the system we're studying and about the underlying ecological mechanism that drive the system. And that questions the possibility for uh, generic indicators like Max suggested, like Max already mentioned, generic indicators of degradation that would be independent of the system and of ecological, underlying ecological mechanism. <coughs> and that also uh, questions the ability of having indicators that can help us compare different type of systems. In this case, the data set we study uh, here in Spain, we actually study systems that are quite different, that have different species composition, for example, um, and different type of soil. So can we have indicators that allow us to compare systems that are quite different? Well, I think that we still need to develop a theory to try to understand further what type of ec ecological mechanism lead to what type of spatial structure. And conversely, if I see a certain type of spatial structure, what do I know about the underlying uh, ecological mechanism? And of course, we need to keep confronting these model predictions with, um, with field data. And that always um, shows that when we go from the theory to the data, we always uh, reveal different type of challenges. And for example, analyzing this, these data in the, in the field um, raises a number of statistical challenges. So we need to also keep developing the statistical tools. Um, there is some work I'm, I'm doing with one of my colleagues, Vasilis Dakos. Uh, we developed indicators of tipping point in time series that we published um, recently in a, in a paper and we put all the, the code freely available online. And we're trying to do the same thing now uh, for spatial, um, spatial indicators. With that, I'd like to thank uh, all my collaborators and you for your attention. Thank you, Sonia. Questions? We have time for one or two questions. Um, I would like to, I, um, as uh, another direction for, for studies that uh, um, is, is worthwhile, um, is to take into account that uh, basically the system is specially extended and uh, I mean basically w what you presented is the common view of systems that uh, undergo a transition or a state transition at once. The whole system goes at once. But when it's, it is specially extended uh, and if there are disturbances which are local, which, which are quite likely, then the system can locally go to the other alternative stable state and then the dynamics is very different. The dynamics then the dynamics of the fronts that separate the two states. And this uh, may lead in principle to, uh, to a shift, global shift that, that occur gradually and actually occur far from the tipping point. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, th these are open questions that on uh, the, the front dynamics is, uh, is this hard problem to study, but this is another direction that uh, uh, should be pursued. Yeah, sure, this is also a, a very relevant in, in the sense of measuring these indicators in the field. It's always, um, when we go to the field, there is always the question of which spatial scale do we want to work at? Where, where do we measure the indicators at, at which until, even for the patch size distribution, of course, the, the larger the image we take, um, yeah, the, 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 the size of the image we look at will, of course, influence also the patch size distribution. So the scale, the spatial scale at which we look at the system is, of course, extremely relevant. Um, really cool uh, talk. Thanks very much. Um, one of the things that uh, we learn from other systems, much simpler systems that I've looked at, is sometimes unless you actually do a, a, a pro, a, an experiment, 
it's very difficult to, to tease out the, the, the forcing processes. And I'm wondering, in this case, if you're thinking about some treatments uh, where you disrupt or alter the management, mm -hmm. and this could have two implications. First off, it could identify which of these very, you know, these toy models, they'll all give rise to, to very simple, to, to, you know, complex behavior, and so it's hard to know which one's which. But also in terms of, pro, uh, of prescribing potential remediatory actions, yeah. I think humanity would be quite interested. Yeah. So um, actually the data set that we initially tested this theory on uh, from three different countries, they were, they were not really experiment, but almost because it was exactly the same system, the same hill, same vegetation, same soil, but they were different owners, different farmers that had different, um, different number of animals. So we had, we knew how many animals we had, they had, and we could really see the effect of grazing on the, on these sites. But I realized afterward that this is kind of an ideal situation. And actually when you go to the field in many cases, like now in this data set, we have different type of soil and we don't really know the history and so on. Um, within this European project, Cascades, um, there is actually a student of Max, Max presented uh, um, he, his, uh, his data, who is um, putting different number of, of animals in enclosed areas. So trying to see the effect of different grazing pressure on, on actually facilitation in this case between different uh, species. But yeah, I think either you have this ideal situation where you have different farmers that coexist on the same hill and then, and then they have different number of animals or different type of, of grazing strategy. Uh, or yeah, the best way of testing the theory is indeed to have really controlled cases where you would control the number of animals, how long they spend in the field, maybe even measuring how much they eat. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that responded to <laughs> your question. Geneva has a question. Uh, you, you, uh, oh, sorry. Your statistics of patches, I understand why you did it. You know, you look at patches with vegetation, and if you looked at the area without vegetation, you, you could not do a similar analysis because it seems it's more forming a continuous uh, pattern. But you could go to the other extreme, yeah. I am sure, in which the vegetation is essentially largely continuous with patches without vegetation. Have people have done a similar analysis for those? Um, actually, right now, I don't, I cannot think of a, of a particular study, but we, we did it many times. So in the model, we look at, for example, the percolation point of bare soil and of vegetation on the country. So you indeed get uh, two different percolation points along the gradient, and it does also provide complementary information, for sure. Well, uh, if it's very quick, yes, but okay. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sonia.